Already, guys, let's start. Let's start. Okay, just make sure the slides present and then we'll start. Okay, so. Okay, so. Okay. Basically, last time we started talking about inheritance. The most important uh, terminology for you to remember is ancestor versus uh, descendants. Let me just do one more uh, small example just to review the terminology quickly, and then we'll start from there. Today we're going to talk about other things that's more advanced, about casting, how you can talk about polymorphism for future arguments, and also for return values. Those are the things we want to touch upon for sure before the, before the reading week. Okay, can you consider this kind of uh, artificial, you know, contrived uh, hierarchy over here? We just want to make sure you are uh, comfortable with ancestor and descendants. Okay? Let's just take uh, different classes, for example. Okay? Let's say the first one. If I say class B, can you tell me what the ancestors are? B and A, don't forget B itself, okay? B and A. And now you should be comfortable with descendants as well, right? Should be B, D, E, I, right? All, everything over here, including itself. So that'll be B, D, E, I. However, the most important thing is to know if I declare some variable of static type B, what would be the expectation I have for this particular variable? For example, if I say B is of type B, what would be the expectation? Sure, certainly BM. And everything that has been inherited from along the ancestor path of B. That would be AM and BM. Would it be CM? No, no not, nothing relevant. Okay, AM, BM. I'll write it down first. Okay, that'll be AM and BM. Let's do something very quickly. For G, you should be comfortable with, comfortable with I should be G, C, and A, right? For ancestor. Okay, let me write it down. G, C, and A, and then, what would be the uh, expectation in this case? GN, CN, AM, right? Okay, very good. Okay, let's do one more. So descendants, you can work it out very easy, okay? One more. What about J in this case? For J, it's basically down at the bottom, at the hierarchy. The lower the class is in the type hierarchy uh, inheritance, the more expectation you can have because they inherit more code intuitively, right? In this case, J will be uh, basically, ancestor J, G, C, A, all the way to the top, right? J, G, C, A. And when you talk about expectation, that'll be, uh, so let me just do it right down in this order. J, N, thank you, G, N, C, N, and A, M. Okay, so now we got three collections of expectation. Let's compare them a little bit more carefully, okay? So now, if you look at the expectation between these two, Okay, uh, let me highlight. First of all, compare the expectation between J and G. What kind of the relationship? Is one a subset of another? Yeah. Apparently, right? Yeah. Simply because J is a descendant class of G. So its expectation should be, oh, let me put it another way. Because G is an ancestor of J. So its expectation must be a subset of J which means J can get more, potentially. You can definitely add more feature. I'll write it down. It's really important, okay? What you observe from these two is because G is an ancestor of J. So we know that, I'll just say E for expectation. The expectation of G is a subset of the expectation of J. Just more, put it more mathematical, right? You, you recognize the subset relations over here. On the other hand, if you compare these two guys, let's say the expectation between B and also G, okay? Can you say much about these two, B and G? Somehow not really, because if you look at the tree over here, they belong to different branches, right? They are not ancestor nor descendants of each other, right? So in that case, you cannot say anything, even though they do have some overlap. Actually, there's one thing you can say about it. You can think about for, let me see this. For B and G, 
they have a common ancestor. Agree? Agree? So that's a common ancestor. Common ancestor of B and G. This is why you got AN and AM over here. That's a consequence, okay? So that really illustrates uh, many things over here. Okay, I'll just put it here. That's a consequence of that. So what you want to be comfortable after the reading week, when we talk about various design patterns, every time we talk about certain static type, you should know exactly what the expectation is. Okay? So we need that kind of knowledge for understanding many design patterns. Okay? Any questions about this? I deliberately make it symbolic so that you, don't, you cannot rely on the names, right? Okay, so there's another one, but I'm gonna leave that to you. Okay, this one we're gonna do some exercise on that for the smartphone. So I'm gonna include it in the iPad notes. Feel free to do exercise off, uh, outside the class. Okay, I wouldn't waste your time. What I want to do now is to say one more thing over here. Okay, so there is uh, this particular slide which I kind of skipped last time. I said you can read it. Let's read it together very quickly. Okay, you want to know what? So this slide is very important. So we talk about in each descendant class, you basically inherit everything from your ancestor, which means you inherit all the expectation from your ancestor. Okay, one thing. More to that, you can declare more expectation of this particular descendant class. You can declare new attributes, you can define new queries or commands, you can even de redefine the things that you uh, inherit from your parents or ancestor. Okay, so this slide is really important. Okay. What's the consequence of this? Okay. We say that every time when you actually got context objects, so basically what I mean is if you compare these two, okay, let me just use a different diagram over here. Right? Let's say we got class A over here. Let's say we got class B. Okay? If you compare these two variables, let's say object one of type A and object two of type B, static types, right? Which variable has more or wider expectations for you? A. Yeah, that's exactly object one, right? This one has wider expectation, right? That's what the slide's saying. Because potentially, in this particular lower level of this uh, descending class, you can define potentially more features, right? Intuitively. That's why you got more expectation, okay, in A. And then, let me go back there, and the second point is, when you are expecting an object of a particular class, you may substitute it with a descending class. So what do I mean that, that, by that? Let's continue with that example over there. If you look at the declaration over here, we talk about, can you do O1 is assigned to O2, number one, or can you do O2 is assigned to O1? Think carefully. One or two? Be careful, right? It's uh, completely symbolic. You cannot rely on the names, right? I heard two, okay. Let's think about why one is not good, and then we'll see why two is good. One is not good simply because if you look at a static type, O2 has the static type B, right, static type. O1 has a static type A. And now think about which class has more expectation as we said, A. A over here has more expectation. If we do allow this particular assignment to occur, let's say we allow, assume for now, that means O1 is now going to point to some objects B over here, right? Dynamically. And now O1 having more expectation okay because O1 remember static type is simply A okay just to remind you so now A can have more expectation than B so you may call some feature for example let's say you got AM that's a new feature over here so if you simply say O1 dot AM in this case you're gonna get crash because B doesn't support AM AM was only introduced at the class level A Okay? That's kind of the reasoning we want to have. I'm just reviewing what we did last time. That's really the essence for you know, uh, thinking about polymorphism and later on dynamic binding. Questions? Yes. 
Mm -hmm. Good question. The question was as follows. Let me just uh, have a uh, new slides. You're basically asking the following. Let me be consistent with the order. We got B, A, and C. Okay. Let's say we got B here, and then inheritance. And we got A here, and then we got C here. Let's say we got BM over here, okay? And then we got AM over here, we got CM over here, okay? They are simply just a new feature at each level. Let's say A will actually inherit BM. You can choose to redefine it, okay? In that case, I'll say plus plus. That means now you got two versions of the BM, right? So now you are asking which version is going to be inherited to C. The answer is the pink version over here. The, late, uh, the closest ancestor that actually uh, redefines the uh, feature. Okay, let me just show it to you, okay? Let's say, let's say BM does something very easy. You simply say print. B dot BM, let's say, okay? That's what BM does. And also for the redefined version over here, we simply say print. And then we say A dot AM. Okay, let's say we only got two versions. So now you're asking which version was inherited to C. Let's try the following code. Let's say I put over here, I simply put, let's say, object one of type uh, B to start with, okay? If I say, first of all, creates B O1.make, what this does is, O1 is now going to point to dynamically an object of type B, right? Remember in the curly brackets, the dynamic type, right? So now if I say O1.bm, what would I get? Bm, B.bm or A.bm? B.bm, right? Sorry, I just made a slight typo. Pardon me. I just meant to say Bm here. Okay, so this one is simply just going to say the green one. So you're gonna say, B dot BM. So this is basically dynamic binding because currently we are pointing to the B object. So it's gonna print out that particular version, right? Corresponding to that version there, okay? Let's change the dynamic type, as we said. If I simply say creates, and then let's say A. O1 dot make. First of all, think about how you can visualize this. Are we creating new objects? We are, because we're using a create keyword. So what we will do basically is this. Okay, let me use a different color. So what this line does is, now O1, rather than pointing to this original object, it is now going to point to a new object that we just created of dynamic type A. So now, if I say the following, if I say O1.bm, notice that these two lines are exactly identical, right? So now, if I say O1.bm, should I print out B.bm or A.bm? A.bm, exactly. So you gotta keep track of the dynamic type in this kind of case, right? I would say usually without any branching, without any loops, it's kind of easy to track. But once you get branching, like if then else, what loops in the context, you'll be a little bit harder, okay? But it's just unavoidable. So this guy over here is going to print out uh, A.bm. Let's do a final one. You can kind of predict what I'm gonna do. Let's say creates, and then I would say C here, O1 dot make. Okay, let's visualize that again. Let's say I'm gonna, uh, that means O1, rather than pointing to this object over here, it is now going to point to just another one, which is of type C, dynamic type. So we keep changing the st uh, dynamic type, but static type doesn't change, right? Now, finally, if I try, O1 dot BM. That's basically your original question. Should we print out basically this version, which is kind of closer to over here, where we are printing out this version, which is kind of further from this version, uh, this class over here? A dot BM, because it's closest. Okay, you just uh, print out the closest version that's in the ancestor, closest. Okay. So what this will do is um, over here. A dot BM. Okay. Questions, please. If we want uh, C to print out B dot BM, would we have to re redefine it, or is there a way to like skip A 
You mean you want the uh, you mean you want, you want the last line to print out b dot bm? Yeah. Okay. Good question. There is no way for you to say. First of all, there is no way. Uh, let me use a um, let's say green. If you simply want to print out potentially, let's say b dot bm, there's no way to say precursor precursor. No, no, just not possible. Okay. If you really want it, the the only thing you can do is say bm plus plus again. And then over there, you put print b dot bm. That's the only way to do. You cannot say, I want to refer to my grandparents or grand grandparents. It's not possible. No language supports that. Yeah. That'd be too complicated, basically. Guys, any question about this? So that one's good because somehow we review dynamic binding as well. Yes? B and, oh, remember in the bond diagram, plus plus means redefine. Yeah, yeah, just uh, make sure you know how to uh, interpret that. Okay, just for your information here, plus plus over here means redefine. Okay, yes? You mean the casting? Yeah. yeah, we'll talk about casting in just a moment. We'll get there. Yeah. So You want to upcast, okay, you are saying the following. Upcasting is not going to really help uh, you solve the problem. Okay, how about this? Let me handle this maybe when we talk about casting. Okay. Yeah, casting is interesting. Okay, casting is about changing the expectation for the variable, right? We'll get there. Okay, so now let's go back to, okay, this one's handled. Okay, let me go back to the slides. I want to go directly to uh, cast. Okay, I'm not skipping anything. Okay, everything we have said already. So there are two examples. Given that we have seen uh, polymorphism, dynamic binding for so many examples, I'm going to leave these two examples for you. Okay, we are basically up to here last time. So there was, there were actually this particular example over here, just about how you can test for polymorphism, different polymorphic assignments. Okay, that one is pretty much similar to what we just did. I'll leave that to you. Okay, that was easy to track. If you got trouble, let me know. Okay, and the next slide is about how you can track dynamic type for the uh, student, right? Either you're pointing to a resident student or you're pointing to a non-resident student, depending on which one it is. You're gonna count, you're gonna apply either premium rates or discount rate. Okay, that one's not easy. Uh, sorry, that one's not hard. It's quite easy. <laughs> it could not uh, something could not be easy, right? When you get loops, but we'll get there. Sorry about that. Wrong conclusion. Let's talk about cast quickly. Okay. Let's talk about this particular example over here. Okay, I did draw something to begin with to save time. I want you to look at the code over here. Only two lines, uh, about three lines. First of all, we declare gin and rs. Notice that the static types are different. Okay. And then we try to say, I want to create gen over here to be of dynamic type resident students. So what I'm doing over here is I say gen is now pointing to a resident students. And notice that gen was declared to be a student, right? Remember? I'll put it aside. Which means from the compiler's point of view, they only consider gen as a student rather than a not, uh, rather than a resident students. That's something to note. And now we are facing the following issue. I am saying the following. I'm saying RS, which was declared to be a resident students. Okay, RS over here. Okay, this module is not useful, so I'll just delete that just to avoid distraction. So now RS, remember, it was declared to be of type uh, resident students. I'll put it down. So now we are asking, can we actually do this particular reassignment? Can we or can we not? Are you sure? R is assigned to Jim. Aha, I'm, I'm glad because somehow from the diagram's point of view, R is being a resident student pointing to a resident student object should be no problem. However, compiler wouldn't allow it simply because you're saying that 
the way I'm going to reassign RS is by copying the address from Jim, right? However, Jim was declared to be a student. And remember, when you see RS is assigned to Jim, how do we declare, uh, how do we decide whether it actually compile or not? Look at the static type. Static type for Jim? Students. Static type for resident students? Resident students. Question you to, uh, for you to ask, is students a sub, uh, descending class of resident students? No. So, not descending class. Okay, so it doesn't compile. Okay, are we okay so far? What I really want to emphasize over here is, it seems like the compiler is not smart enough. It seems like. Because even though we are so sure, Jim, even though declared with static type students, is actually pointing to a resident students. Then why can we not assign RS into this particular resident students object? That's the whole story. It seems like compiler is not flexible enough. But is it really because the, uh, the compiler, the people who imp implement compiling Eiffel Studio or Eclipse being not smart enough? Well, that might be something that's more inherent about decidability. Have you heard about this word before? 2001? Okay. Let me just speak a, a little bit about this because at this level, you deserve to know it. I present a challenge to you. By the end of the semester, if you can finish this program here and make it work, you get an A plus for this course immediately. Here's the challenge. Listen carefully, okay? Your program is going to take two inputs. It's going to take some arbitrary Eiffel program, or even Java program, I don't mind. Arbitrary. When I say arbitrary, I mean a single class which may have a main method and then, let's say we assume they have a main method or root class, right? And then it may contain assignments, it may contain if statements, it may contain loops, for loop, while loop, across loop, doesn't matter, arbitrary. And then the second input is a variable name, okay? Two inputs, a program and a variable name. The output of your program is very easy. Just tell me what's the last dynamic type for this particular variable. Just tell me, okay? Yeah, let's uh, use one example to explain, okay? Let's say my class could be as easy as, I simply declare S to be of static type students, and then I only got a single statement here to create it. So what should be the answer in this case? Resident students. That would be the answer for this simple case. But can you a program solve this problem in general for any arbitrary Java or Eiffel program? It turns out it's an undecidable problem. Okay, let me just mention just a little bit more detail. I don't want to trouble you too much. How can you prove that this is undecidable? Somehow, the best thing you can do is to somehow simulate how the program is going to be executed, but what if the program has a very complicated loop that never terminates? For example, if I got something like this, I'll just modify this guy here a little bit, okay? I'll simply say while something, just something very uh, uh, arbitrary, a very complicated uh, condition over here, right? And then I'll simply say that creates uh, resident students as the make. And then outside the loop, I'm gonna say maybe creates non-resident students and then as the make, okay? So you got two possible dynamic type as the answer, okay? So now, Here's a problem. If the best you could do is to simulate the program, what if this condition evaluated true always? You never get to terminate. Then what's your answer? Right? Question. Is that the it's more like a holding problem, right? But let's not go too far. You know, let's not go there. But I just want to tell you that this is some undecidable problem you wouldn't learn back in 2001. But it's very practical. The reason that for any uh, programming ID you might use for C Sharp, Visual Studio, Eclipse, e uh, e Studio, they will always, they will all suffer from this particular uh, limitation. They can never keep track of the dynamic type in your program. Okay, simply because the loop. If you don't have loops, it might be possible. Okay. 
That's the, this one is optional. I just want to give you a little bit more insights, right? No compiler can do that. So don't try. Don't waste your time. It's just not possible. Yeah. All right. All right. Let's go back here. Let's go back to here. Uh, basically, uh, I'll go back to this example here. Okay. Sorry. Okay. So now, now that we know that to really keep track of dynamic type is simply undecidable. No compiler can ever do it. So now, for us as a programmer, what can we do? In this particular scenario, if we are so sure, if we are so sure, RS is really pointing to a object dynamically of type resident students, we can force the compiler to say, now I'm giving you this particular knowledge, trust, trust me. Okay, that's a cast. Okay, that's what you can do. Now, how can we do cast? Well, of course, you learn back in Java how to do cast. The idea is similar. There's certain subtlety which I'll point out a little bit later. But let's see how the syntax can be done. You, you may have, uh, I think you have done something similar in your lab number two. Let's just see what the syntax really means. Okay, okay let's see. Uh, for this particular problem over here, how can we force the compiler to believe that Jim is really pointing to a resident student? And just to remind you, again, from the compiler's point of view, Jim is of static type students. Okay, just to remind you. And from the compiler's point of view, uh, RS is of static type resident students. Okay? So now, how can we do it? That's kind of the syntax. Okay? You're going to say, overall, it's going to be a check assertion, check and end. What do you check? You check to see whether, when I try to cast Jim, the variable I want to uh, change its stat, uh, it change its expectation basically, and then I want to cast that maybe into resident students. Okay, attach simply means if the cast is going to succeed, you're going to create an alias. So what do I mean by alias? The alias name is going to call rsgym. Think about rsgym is just going to be a new variable we are introducing, and its static type is simply just going to be a new one that we're trying to cast into. So that one would be resident students. Resident students over here. And then we're saying that now RSGIM, if the cast is possible, RSGIM is now going to point to the same objects, just an alias. No new objects being created. Two things to mention. Number one, no new objects is created. And number two, which is also important, Number two, the static type of Jim was not modified. Because we said static type never changes. The only thing we did was to try to create an alias of Jim, which is over here, RS Jim, and then try to make its static type something that's a little bit more specific, right? Resident students. So now, when we try this particular assignment over here, let's see this, right? When we say RS is assigned to RS Jim, so now should this be allowed, right? I think about how the compiler is going to uh, reason about this. Okay. Again, it's going to look at the static type only. What's the static type of RS? As we declared, RS is simply just going to be resident students. Okay. The static type is simply resident students. Now, what about RS underscore Jim? How do you figure? Look at what that was cast into. If you can reach this line, that means the cast was successful. Otherwise, you, you would have caused a uh, check assertion violation, right? So now over here, the static type, the static type over here is simply also resident students. Now we ask the same question. Is resident students a descending class of itself? Yes. So it compiles. Okay, that's how you do a cast. A very common error goes like this. If, let's say, outside the check, let me just add a new line, okay? Let's say we add a new line over here. If you simply say, RS is assigned to RS Jim, do you think it's going to compile the same line? Why not? Exactly, right, yeah, okay, just simply outside the scope for the check. You can think about, you can only use that particular new alias within the same check assertion. Okay, yeah. Okay, something just for you to uh, remember. Oh, let me say one more thing. 
You can also try to cast two variables at the same time if you wish. Okay, let me just explain to you why. Again, let's see, this is the expression for uh, the cast. You say check, for example, I would say attached. Attached, let's say resident students gym s, let's say rs gym. One thing to note, this particular expression over here, attached s, is simply just a Boolean expression. It is going to be true if the cast was successful and the alias was created. It will be false if the cast was failed. Okay. So now, how can I do two casts at the same time? Just use conjunction. So what you can say is, now I can say and, okay, keyword, and then I can just do another cast. So I can say attached, for example, let's say non-resident students. Let's say Alan, for example, Alan. And then we can say S, N, R, S, and then Alan over here. You can do as many as you like by using conjunction, right? Then, N. And now inside the scope for this check assertion here, you can use RSGN. You can also use NRS Allen. And a very quick reinforcement. RSGN static type should be RS, right? The one we try to cast it into. What about the static type for NRS Allen? NRS over here, okay? Yeah, it's a different syntax, but the idea is very similar. In Java or in C Sharp, the C family language. When you try to do cast, you're just creating an alias. Okay, you're not cre really creating any new objects. Question. Yeah. So basically, uh, this is just about syntax. We're gonna in the next step is to think about at the runtime how can a cast go wrong? Because apparently this is a check assertion, right? It might pass, it might fail. You want to know under what circumstances precisely can you actually fail this particular uh, check assertion for cast. You want to know the condition, okay? Let's see exactly how we can do that. Question. If you only use the if, um, check is more like an assertion to the compiler. So if you use the if, so that means if it really fell, you wouldn't really cause any contra violation. You simply just go to the else branch, right? But this one, if evaluate to false, then it will just give you the contra violation. Yeah, it's different. Okay. So guys, the question was, what if, what would be the difference if you simply change this guy over here to be if, okay? The difference is, in case any of the cast actually fell, no contra violation or check assertion violation will occur, okay? Because you would simply go to else branch. So you better use the check. Okay, that's about this particular uh, cast. And now, what we need to do is to think about a more general issue. Okay, now we're gonna talk about, now that we know the syntax, when can cast fail, okay? Let's think about some, I'll talk, I'll talk about a general form first, and then we'll use examples, right? Okay. Guys, please. All right, let's see what we can do over here. Let's say, just in general, this is a general form for the cast. Let's say we have a variable y, and then we want to cast that into c, okay? Here's the subtle difference from Java, okay? You don't have to worry about Java, of course. But if you took 2030 with me, if you want to review your notes, but it's not required. In Java, if you try to do a cast, there are certain scenarios that you try to do a cast, if the type you're trying to cast is neither an ancestor nor a descendant class of the static type of the variable you're trying to cast, it's going to give you a compile time error. That's in the Java case, okay? In case you know, it's a review. If you don't know, that's fine. In iPhone, it's more like a design decision for them. Every time you try to do a cast, you will always compile, always, always. Never a compilation will, will never fail. So now, what you should know is, when can you actually get a runtime uh, cast uh, assertion error? That's the question, okay? And the criteria is very similar. Basically, uh, let's see this. Let's have a look at, uh, to see if you can understand conceptually, okay? Let's say we have y here. 
let's say previously we simply got some line like this. We can say creates. Uh, let me just make it more symbolic for you. Okay, let's say this is D. Okay, just type D. Create D and then Y dot make. So this is the dynamic type for Y. So that's why I put it here in the hierarchy. Okay, let me just label that. Okay, D is here, right here. Okay, and then we are asking, can we actually cast Y over here into C, which is lower in the hierarchy? Can we or can we not? First of all, it compiles. As I said, any class you try to cast, even though it's completely irrelevant, it will still compile. So what you should know is which kind of uh, cast is going to give you runtime assertion error. In this particular case, given that Y's dynamic type is simply D, which means it can satisfy everything that's expected from D. Now, if we are trying to cast into C, do you think there might be any problem, potentially? If you think there's a problem, guys, you want to help us? Jordan, please, if you got any idea. Uh, so, sorry, uh, yeah, so C is a lower class, yes. So expect more C. Uh, let me help you a little bit. Expect more, for sure. C definitely expects more than Y's dynamic type, for sure. Let's say, for example, if I put CM over here, okay? In that case, yeah, what's going to happen? If Let's say we allow this cast to happen, then what's going to happen? Uh, shouldn't be allowed. Shouldn't be allowed, why? What if we allowed? Are we going to get some kind of crash? Yeah, because uh, the static type would indicate which call CM, right? Okay, that's pretty much there. Okay, let me, let me help you. Okay, it's a bit symbolic. I know it's kind of challenging, but we'll get a concrete example for you just in a moment. Let's say for now, attach uh, cast Y into C, let's say S, C, Y, let's say. Uh, let's say we allowed. Assume we allowed. This cast. The consequence is the static type of CY would be C. C, right? Agree? That's what we cast it into. Okay, first of all, that's good. Uh, would be simply just C. So now, what can we expect on C? CM. So that means when we try to do CY, dot cm, whereas the dynamic type is simply just d, as we said. Can d actually support the cm, which is newly introduced at a lower level? No, we're going to get crash. That's exactly why you will get a runtime cast assertion violation at a runtime. So this is not allowed. Can you somehow, from this particular kind of abstract example, can you figure out a rule more general? How can the runtime decide whether this particular cache should be allowed or not? Check some, uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. You want to be, be, be uh, precise, as precise as possible? Yes, go ahead. Yeah. I try to be as precise as possible. You're getting a little bit too, you know, around. Anybody want to try? We just want to formulate a rule, right? And then we'll try to test it. We'll try to see more example. Well, let me give you an idea over here. Okay, let me just reveal the rule. How about that? And then you can think more about it, okay? So now, basically, okay, so now, first of all, this is something we just said, okay? We're saying that if somehow you're trying to cast, actually, this one already tells you, what if the type you're trying to cast into is not an ancestor of the dynamic type, which means you're trying to cast into something you simply just cannot fulfill because that thing actually got more expectation. So now what, what should be the rule? It should be an ancestor, okay? So let me just write it down. For a cast to be successful, okay? C over here must be an ancestor type, including 
including Weiss dynamic type itself. Ancestor of Weiss dynamic type. Okay, that's the rule. You want to really think about it, right? I know it might be a little bit shock, right? If you haven't seen this before, but that's kind of the reasoning over here. Simply because if you allow this cast to happen, uh, being ancestor means you are you're, you're not trying to create any new um, expectation to be called. Okay. okay, let's say uh, you have seen this. Let's do example. I just want to introduce a rule first, and then let's see examples. Okay, I'm gonna get several examples over here to see how you can play with the cast with different notation. Okay, let's try. Everything's on the slide. I'm just using iPad to go a little bit more smoothly. First example, okay? Let's go back to our smartphone example, right? We introduced it last time, okay? Let's say over here, the first one. We declare my phone over here to be of static type iOS. So I'm gonna use my convention over here. I'm gonna put green over here as the, oh, sorry, iOS. So this is a static type for my phone, okay? Let's pick a nose over here. The static type of my phone. Okay? And now what I'm gonna do is, if I say create iPhone 11 Pro, my phone that make, I'm basically saying, now I'm creating a new object of type iPhone 11 Pro and let my phone store its address, right? So now we know that dynamic type for uh, my phone should be iPhone 11 Pro over here, right? So the green one is a static type. The red one, pink one, is the dynamic type, right? They're different, okay? So now, in the following uh, two casts, we're going to see how we can play with the cast. Uh, the way I remember the cast rule is to say, either you can do upcast or downcast, okay? Let's see how we can do it. Either one is okay. Let's do the first one, okay? Uh, this one, I just want to illustrate the, the, the diagram, okay? Let me just use the same one, okay? That's an iOS over here, static type, dynamic type. Now, I want you to consider this particular line, just this line, the one that's highlighted, okay? Make it bigger for you, okay? Now, what am I trying to do over here, really? Somehow I say I want to cast my phone into a smartphone, right? If I'm trying to do this, as you can see, I'm trying to go upwards in the hierarchy, right? What I'm trying to cast into is like this. Okay, so now let me just use different color over here. Let's say use, uh, let's say blue, okay? Let's say smartphone is the type I want to cast into. In that case, I want to cast that into smartphone. In two, do you think this might succeed at the runtime? I'm doing an upcast. Whether that should exceed, uh, succeed or not depends on whether the dynamic type can support its expectation. Can iPhone 11 Pro satisfy all the expectation of a smartphone? Yes. yes, of course. So the cast will just succeed, okay? However, however, the important thing is, let's see this. Let's say I got my phone over here. What's the static type of my phone? iOS, iPhone, or smartphone? Smartphone, right, guys? Please, please be careful, right? That's the type we're trying to cast into. Be careful, okay? Smartphone. Wait, wouldn't that be ST? Would be SP. SP, absolutely. Sorry, sorry, sorry. So actually, you were right when you said, I, uh, when you said iOS. My mistake, my bad, okay? Let me say that again, Beg your pardon me. My phone static type remains to be iOS, no problem, okay? And SP, the one we try, the alias we're creating, should be smartphone. Okay, that's what I meant to say. Okay, that's static type. So now my question for you, can you tell me dial, surf web, FaceTime, quick take, Skype, SiteSync, ZoomH. These are all the features I collected from the hierarchy, okay? Can you tell me which ones I can call on SP? Uh, 
Dial surf web. Okay, can I call FaceTime? But dynamic type is actually iPhone 11 Pro. Ah, uh -huh, exactly. Okay, be careful. Every time I ask you what feature you can call, you have to look at a static type. Because now SP is the alias version that has a static type smartphone. So now I can call everything from the smartphone. So dial and surf web. So it turns out when you see the slides uh, over here, so you can call these two. Oh, you can call these two. Whereas all the others you just cannot call. It will be a compiled time error. Yes? No, on my phone you can see static type iOS in the first line. Okay. Yes. The, the green one. Correct. iPhone 11 Pro. That's the pink one. Okay. So after after the attach the check attach. Mm -hmm. um, my phone my phone doesn't change at all, right? My phone remains to be the same. Yes, static type of my phone remains the same. Oh, we're thinking this way. Okay, let me just review very quickly. So um, you can think about after the cast has succeeded, we basically basically got my phone. Sorry, we basically got my phone, and also we got SP. They both point to the same objects of type iPhone 11 Pro. Okay, dynamic type, right? iPhone 11 Pro. However, from the compiler's point of view, for my phone, its static type is simply iOS. For SP that we just cast, static type is smartphone. They point to the same objects, but the expectation from the compiler's point of view is different. That's the, that's the essence of this example. Okay. Guys, questions? Yes. After attaching the smartphone, like the, I have to look over static type of SP to actually checking out, right? Checking this. Is oh, you mean for compilation or for runtime? Okay, again, for compilation in iPhone, in our context for this course, whenever you do a check, attach, assertion like a cast, it always compiles, no question, no always compiles. So what we want to check is runtime, right? the runtime. Runtime, you want to see whether the current dynamic type for my phone is able to support the type you're trying to cast into, right? That's basically what you're checking, yeah. Okay, guys, let's do one more, okay? Shall we? Let's do one more. Okay, so now that's what we have. Let's change a new page, okay? The same. I want to look at different line. Again, uh, we have static type is iOS, and we have dynamic type is uh, iPhone 11 Pro, okay? And now I want you to look at this particular line for me, okay? I'm gonna put it in blue. This line. Again, every cast in the iPhone context compiles everything. Okay? Do you think we're going to get any cast violation? Well, really? Let's see diagrammatically, right? Over here, you can see we are trying to cast that into iPhone 11 Pro, which collapsed with this particular one, right? We're basically trying to cast my phone into its own dynamic type. Do you think iPhone 11 Pro is going to be able to uh, fulfill the expectation of itself? Yes. Of course. In that case, that also succeed. So, so far we talk about success. We talk about failure a little bit later. Okay? Shady, are you okay? Yeah. Okay, maybe you study that a little bit. Okay. Okay, guys, any questions about this? So now the, the important thing is, after this cast has succeeded, what we should check is as follows, okay? So now have a look at this. iPhone 11 Pro, its static type will just be iPhone 11 Pro. So now if you compare the previous cast, in the previous cast, we say that for SP, after the cast, we could only get access to dial and surf web simply because the cast type is simply smartphone at the top. So now we are trying to cast the same objects, iPhone Pro 11, right? Now, what can we call on IP11 Pro? Yeah, basically we can call dial, surf web, we can call FaceTime, we can also call quick cake, nothing else, right? So these are all the things we can call because the 
test type is simply the blue one, which will support everything you, you inherit from all your ancestors. Okay, so now, I'll write it here. iPhone 11 Pro can be expected features of ancestor. All the ancestors of iPhone 11 Pro. Okay, I'll put it here. Every feature there. Okay. Are we okay? Yes. Yeah. So, surf, you talk about surf web feature? Yes, you can definitely uh, get access to it. That's fine. Uh, for the pre no, no, no. Yet in previous one, we could. Okay, maybe uh, this misunderstanding here. You talk about previous one, right? If you look at the previous one, let's say over here, SP. The type we're trying to cast into is smartphone, which is the blue one over here, right? So in that way, of course, SP can call dial and surf web for sure. Those are the only two. Yeah. The other one? Okay. If, uh, yeah. Over here, wait, wait. so no, okay. If you use, uh, okay, let's talk, uh, let me make sure I understand you correctly. First of all, we talk about IP11 Pro, am I? Okay, good. What can we call an IP11 Pro? First of all, IP11 Pro has the static type iPhone 11 Pro, which is over here. So that means you can call everything that's in the current class, quick take, for example, its ancestor, which is FaceTime. Oh, you're talking about the version of, okay, now I see what you mean. You're right, you're right. Ada made a very good point. So that should be, when I say surf web, I mean this particular version because surf web has been redefined. Of course, you would call that version. Absolutely, I agree. Yes. That's a good point. When yes. you call it even on uh, SP, which is smartphone, when you call it still call the redefined version because the redefined version would still meet the contracts requirements of... Uh, you're talking about... Um, sorry, are you talking about a surf web over here? Yeah. That's a redefined version, yes. You would say plus plus. You'll still use that. Oh, good question. So that, um, that's something actually you, you got a question about before. Okay. Let's say this. Let me uh, illustrate that. Let me use a simpler example. Otherwise, it's a little bit messy. Okay. Can we just use A, B, C again? Okay. It's just A and B. A here, and also we got B here. A, M, and also B, M. Let's say for A, M, we say plus plus. Okay. Let's say for AM, we simply say print A dot AM. And in the redefined version, we say print B dot AM. Okay, let's say we've got two versions of the AM. One is uh, default, the other one is redefined. You're basically asking the following question. Let's say if I have the following objects of type A or even B, doesn't matter, let's say A, okay? And then I say creates B O dot make. What happened is O is now going to point to a dynamic object of type B, okay? Now, if I simply say O dot A M, what should I get? Uh, AM, agree? Okay, that one we, we went through already, but now I'm just adding a slight complication in the next line. So this one is going to be B dot AM. Let's do a little bit cast. So now if I do the following cast, okay, let me, let me write it at legibly. So what I would do is I would say check, I want to cast that into A. And then O, I'm talking about S. Let's say I want to cast that into A objects, A O, okay? And then N. Now, if I say A O dot A M. First of all, do you think this code will compile? Cast always compile, right? And also A O 
has the static type A. Agree? OK, static type A. Now, when I say dot .am, am I going to call this version over here, or am I going to call this version over here? First or second? I heard first. I heard second. That, that's good. It's good that I went over this. It's a common confusion, I guess. OK, that's exactly what you were asking about 15 minutes ago. That's good. That's good. So now let's think about this. Dynamic binding is going to be play the key role over here. Dynamic binding simply means whatever object that's being pointed to is a key, regardless of the static type. So now let me draw the picture here. After this particular cast over here, what we have is AO is an alias to the same object. Agree? From the compiler's point of view, O is of static type A. AO here is of static type uh, A. Okay, just casting. Okay, so now in this case, which version of AM am I going to call still depends on which object is being pointed to, which is B. So I will still call B.AM. You, if you want to know which version will be called, all you look at is dynamic type. Now let's put it this. Which, okay, this here's a, here's a common principle, okay? It does a line compile, you look at a static type compilation. And then you want to know version of feature call from the particular line. It's more like a runtime behavior. You want to look at dynamic type. Okay. So now in this case, even though AO has been cast into A, you know what? I can even more make the example more interesting. It doesn't change anything. I can simply say this is just B. That means from the compiler's point of view, the static type for O is simply just B. OK? And then I'm casting into static type A for AO. So now AO and O, they're both pointing to the same objects of type B dynamically, right? It's a, uh, there are two uh, names for the same objects. So now when I say AO.AM, it's up to the runtime execution machine to decide which version to call. They will see, OK, AO, if I follow the pointer, is now pointing to this particular object of type B dynamically. So I will look at, do I have a version of uh, AM in B? I do. I do have it over there and execute it. If I don't, I will go for search the uh, closest version in the ancestor. Okay. So now this one is going to give me also B.AM. Guys, make sure you understand this. I wouldn't mind explaining it again, because you will see this kind of stuff in design pattern, right? That's really important to understand runtime behavior. The, the, the idea is, if I ask you a question about which version of the feature is going to be called, you typically have to draw some diagram to see what the arrow is pointing to currently. If it is pointing to a B object, of course, you call the B version. If it is pointing to A object, you call the A version. Right? You're going to see the dynamic type. Yes. Yeah, you're basically asking how can we actually call this version over here, right? The idea is simple. Simply because you create a B object, it's definitely going to call the B version. If you want to call the A version, create an A object. Hmm? That's the only way, yes. Yeah. Uh huh. Oh, you're talking about another class, right? We may. Mm -hmm. To downcast, yes, you can, yeah. OK, let's try this, OK? Since like we got, OK, A here, OK, B here, and C here, OK? AM, BM, and CM. So let's say AM over here is redefined. 
Okay, are you talking about another redefined version over here in C? Object B, okay, of what type? What if I want? Uh, okay, let's put question mark here, and then? Mm -hmm. So, okay, basically, whatever that will be allowed or not depends on static type. Okay, let, let's try this, okay. So let's say if I have B of type, let's say A, okay? So now, can I actually do, let's say, check attached B as C. Oh, sorry, ah, confuse myself. This should be C over here, right? We'll cast that into C. Okay, S, let's say, C objects, end. Again, this cast will always compile, no problem, right? So now, can we do this cast or not? Depends on the dynamic type of C O, uh, sorry, uh, of B. I'll write it down. Whether this cast uh, succeed it, uh, succeed at runtime depends on if the, ca the type we're trying to cast into if C is an ancestor of B over here, B's dynamic type. That's the rule. How about this? I would suggest for the benefit benefits of everybody, why don't you just drop by? We'll talk, let's talk after class to see exactly what you're thinking about. Maybe I can make some example out of it. That'll be easier for everybody. Otherwise, I'm thinking aloud, which may not be very useful. Yes, question. Yes. Yeah. Which one? This one? Uh, the one that had, like, the sure. You mean this guy here? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh huh. And then when you have the block where you're doing check attack smartphone, mm -hmm. does that change the dynamic type only for that block and then change it back after that block ends, or does it keep it at smartphone? No, 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 no. You're going too far. Okay. So what we're doing here, good. Okay. Let's see. This line here, we change the dynamic type of my phone to iPhone 11 Pro. Agree? This line. This line over here, we don't change the dynamic type. It still points to the same objects. We're creating an alias. Okay? This line over here, do we change the dynamic type? No, we're creating another alias. So that cast doesn't actually affect my phone, it just creates another. Exactly. So exactly what I said. Remember this diagram I just drew? Over here? Basically I said whenever you when you try to create uh, introduce RS Gym. RS gem is not pointing to a new object. It points to the same object, alias. Right? It's just that the object's type, of, uh, so the, the variable's type after the cast is now being another type that you cast into. So gem is like neither the static type or the... Yes, so now you can see, let's go back to this, this example over here. Gym, the, the thing you want to cast into, right? That one has student static type. And RS gem pointing to the same object, it has a different static type. So there are different set of features you can call on these two variables. That's the uh, the uh, essence. Okay, guys, that's good. That's good. Okay. Okay. How about we do? Uh, okay, I still got how many more? We gotta finish this maybe uh, in the lecture after the reading week very quickly. Okay. I still got one, two, three, four, and after that we have to go over arguments, go over feature return value. Okay, it can be done within half an hour. Okay. Not now, don't worry, not now. Okay, so uh, let me see, what's the time? It's about 35? Okay, I would like to stop now.